Well, thank you, everyone. So this is my second Codex talk, which is, I think, a, a rare privilege. So thank you, Rakesh, for that. And hopefully, I will not repeat myself if you've seen my first Codex talk. If you have seen my first Codex talk, I don't know if there's coffee still out there. It might be an opportunity to grab a quick one. Um, who are we and what do we do? And why do we think hands are important? So Shadow started out 25 years ago as a company, 35 years ago as a group of people. And we actually set out thinking we'd build a humanoid robot, which is an interesting segue from the previous talk. And the reason we don't build humanoid robots very hard, as, uh, very hard for anymore, as the previous talk said, is it's very, very hard to build a useful humanoid. The cost of standing up, like I'm doing now, is incredible some huge amount of your body's energy is taken up, just keeping you upright to do things, which is why we like to sit down at workbenches, which is why we like to lean against things. So we thought to ourselves, if the, if the whole humanoid is really hard, if standing up and walking is really, really difficult, what is it that we can get robots to do that they don't currently do that will give them an advantage in the world? And we sat and we looked around at what people were doing with robot technology, what people were building in terms of hardware, and we kept coming up against something. Our entire world is built around this thing. Everything is designed to be operated by four fingers and a thumb, possibly a second one, not too far apart, about this kind of height. So why didn't robots have that? And we looked and we found that back in the 1980s, there was the Utah MIT dexterous hand, which was a three finger hand that had some of the human capabilities, but not many of them. And no one had done anything since. And we thought, this seems weird. If robots are going to get out into the world and do tasks, they're going to need to have the same sort of dexterous abilities as humans do. So let's try and build that. And we set out and we built a series of, of hands for robots. We then had the, what I still think is probably my luckiest break ever, which was that we put pictures of these up on our website and a couple of researchers emailed us and said, can I buy one of these? And now for a, a group of people building things for fun in their attic, as an interesting project to do, having someone walk in the door and say, I, I'd like to buy that, I'd like to buy that, is kind of transformative. It gives you a, a whole different perspective on the world. So we sat there and we looked at that and we said, well, what is it that the robot hand gives us? What's different? What does it need? Um, one of the things that we noticed about humans is that we are very, very good at handling objects, but we don't need to see the object to do that. Sometimes when I reach for an object and pick it up, I use my eyes to see it. If I'm going to reach an object, I don't know where it is. I'll look at that object. I'll try and understand where it is. I'll at least at some level have an idea whether it's there or there or there. But most of the time when I'm handling things, I'm not looking at them. I'm using my perception. I'm using my sense of touch. I'm using my ability to remember where I thought something was and then reach to where it probably still is and work from touch. Robots are very bad at that. Most robots need things to be in exactly where you left them or exactly where you told them. And most vision systems for robots aren't very good at finding things. I was talking to somebody at Rolls-Royce a few years ago who said, oh yeah, we've looked at using vision, but it's only 99.99% accurate. And I was like, that's a fantastically high precision figure. He said, that means that once a day, a robot picks something up wrong and slams it into something and breaks the production line. Once a day per work cell, on the production line. Four nines is not enough to run a manufacturing plant on anything. You have to get much better than that. And currently, robot vision isn't that good. It still has amazing performance. If you've seen some of the, the work that's been done with deep learning systems, where they're able to, to recognize things and understand things and tell you which badly handwritten Chinese character that is with better accuracy than human can, that's really, really impressive. But what it doesn't do is let you say that object is exactly seven millimeters that way and four millimeters that way from that other object at 37 degrees orientation, which would allow a mechanical gripper to pick it up. Because what happens when the mechanical gripper tries to pick up the object and it doesn't quite know where it is, is it bends it, it breaks it, it bashes it, it destroys it. And if you're going to have robots operating in the real world doing useful tasks for us, well, they can get away with that occasionally, but Essentially, if that's walking around your house or rolling around your house, picking things up, what you don't want is it breaking the objects. You don't want your family heirlooms destroying. You don't want it to get a can of soup out of the fridge and well, break it for you. So the robot has to be better than that. We know that humans can compensate for not having a sense of touch. We know how humans do this. There's quite a lot of understanding of the way that, for example, people with prostheses work 
and are able to reach and grasp objects even though they can't feel a sense of touch. But what they do is they concentrate a lot. They stare very, very hard at it. And if you've ever come in, got to your front door when it's really, really cold and your hands are cold and you've reached into your pocket to try and get your keys out, and not only is it painful to do that, it's difficult to remember where they, even though you know where they are, because they're always where they are, but you get them out and now you have to fumble between them and get the right key. And that's incredibly difficult because your sense of touch is gone because your hand is so cold. And there are some fascinating psychology experiments where people have had their hands numbed and tried to do particular tasks and it just becomes 10 or 20 or 50 times slower doing the task. Uh, this is a robot solving a Rubik's Cube in about a quarter of a second. It does this by having essentially six rods that clamp the cube on each face so it can twist and twist and twist and twist and twist. It's incredibly fast and you can't work out how it's doing it unless it's really, really slowed down. If, of course, that cube is five millimeters off to the left or five, five, ten degrees out in its orientation, the robot can't do it because it doesn't have any actual understanding of what it's touching, what it's interacting with. It's just holding it in exactly the right place and doing a repeated sequence of movements. Effectively, this is automation. So what happens when we give it touch? Well, the video here is a human operating a robot hand without vision. So the guy at the back there, Mike, he's wearing a blindfold. He's wearing a glove that his company Haptex make, which provides you with a sense of touch feedback to your fingertips. And the robot hand in the foreground, which is one my company makes, has got some sensors from a company called Syntouch that give it a sense of touch. And you can see there, as he moves the hand across, he feels with his thumb the contact with the ball, and then he's able to pick the ball up. And that's a point where the human is able to use their natural intelligence around touch and dexterity to show the robot how to do a task that honestly, trying to pick up things off the table without knowing where they are for a robot is incredibly difficult. It's just scrabbling and grasping and they, they tend to lose them and break them. So to do this, we're, we're exploiting the intelligence of the human by giving the robot a sense of touch. Now this is a hack because we're cheating and we're not actually making the robot intelligent, we're exploiting the intelligence of the humans. But this is not a bad hack because at the moment, robots don't have enough intelligence to be able to exploit a sense of touch. So what can we do when we do that? And why do we want to use this hack? What's it interesting for? Well, we think there are four things that you can do when you use a robot to give a human a sense of touch in another place. The first thing you can do is just put the skills somewhere else. So we've done some work with the Mayo Clinic where they had a bunch of doctors at Mayo do diagnostic procedures on a bunch of bioengineers in London. And that was fun. Uh, we didn't let them do the spinal column sampling that fluid sampling one, they, were, they had a mock-up for that, but they were able to pick up a, an ultrasound probe and use the ultrasound probe. They were able to do a uh, test for heartbeat. They were able to verify that one of my engineers actually does in fact have a heart, which was a bit of a surprise to his girlfriend and a lot of a surprise to the rest of us. But you know, it's nice to know that we've had not just verified it, but verified it internationally. Um, obviously there's a challenge with doing that because a doctor who do, did it for a procedure in practice would have to be registered both in the US and in the UK to practice which would be more challenging, but actually Mayo's interest is much more simple. They provide a lot of remote diagnostic support for small clinics. If you're a small clinic in the middle of nowhere, you don't have lots and lots of people. So you want to be able to get a senior expert to have a look at someone who's manifesting some interesting symptoms and touch the patient and feel them go, oh yeah, those nodules there. Okay, we need to get this person to somewhere we can do more work on them. The second part is machine learning. If we're going to get robots to understand the world, we're going to need a lot of AI behind it, a lot of AI. To do that, either the robots can try and learn by themselves, and we've seen the results of that. They break things, they bash things, they break themselves, they destroy the world around them. Or we can show the robots how to do the tasks. We can get people who can already do them to operate the robot and use human intuition to drive that. And then that gives us perfect learning data for the robots. And there are already some really powerful examples of copying learning data from humans into robots to get robots to do skilled tasks. So that's a really exciting opportunity. The, the third is the classic robotics application, distant, dirty, dangerous, and difficult. Putting robots somewhere you just don't want to go. Uh, nuclear is a classic example of this. Offshore work is another one. We've seen a lot of examples of places where it's just really hard to get someone into because it's the pile of paperwork to get the person in is the same height as the person who's going in there. And you have to do that for every task that you do. It costs a fortune. So if you can put a robot there and give it the same ability as a human had, you can eliminate that challenge. 
challenge. And lastly, once we start getting these robots bootstrapped into the world and they've got intelligence, they've got dexterity, they've got enough ability to start doing things, well, that four nines number comes back. Sure, the robot's working almost all the time, but sometimes it doesn't. What do you do then? And the answer there is you connect a human and the human says to the robot, what's going on? Oh, right, okay, I can see how to fix this. I can see how to change this because I can use my intelligence, my perception and my touch to make the robot a little bit better to get over that problem so the robot can then continue with the task. So we think that what touch does is it makes the impossible possible. So it doesn't make the impossible possible, it makes the difficult intuitive. I always read this slide wrong. The idea with touch is that you could, you could probably work out how to do the task if you could control the environment, if you could lock the world down, if you could simplify, simplify, simplify. But when you have to cope with the variability of the real world, when you have to cope with uncertainty and change, you're going to need a way to correct. You're going to need a way to understand the difference between, oh, it wasn't quite as hard as I thought it was. It wasn't quite where I thought it was. And that's what touch gives us as humans, and therefore it's what it gives to robots. So if I'm going to make a prediction, I think my prediction is pretty simple. It's that for robots to be really useful in the real world, they're going to need to have a lot of human dexterity, but they're going to need to have even more of human touch. They're going to need to be able to understand things they're in contact with. They're going to need to be able to understand what they're touching. Whether they can then use that for empathetic interaction, because this is something we all do. You meet somebody and you shake hands with them, you touch them, you interact with them. And can we get a robot to understand the empathy? Can we get a robot to understand how touch is a means of communication for us? I think that's a fascinating next step challenge for my colleague down here. For us, it's more about can we get the robots to interact just with the objects that we work with to do the tasks and the tools and work with them. And for that, we think they need human-like hands with a human-like sense of touch. Thank you.